final session. Our final session is a panel discussion, and we're just grabbing our last speaker to come down and join us. Jordan's going to come down here to the front with the others. I've been asked before we do that to say a little bit more about the play which you saw last night and, and how that text came into being. Um, there is... Uh, there are actually two original transcriptions of the 1523 debate in Zurich. One Protestant, one Catholic, right? <laughs> Same debate, two transcriptions, two very different points of view of what actually happened. And actually, there's one of the transcriptions, I think it's the Protestant transcription annotated by a Catholic who really didn't think that that transcription was valid, right? So you get this back and forth conversation. Um, the transcriptions were then translated into English in a early 20th century selected writings of Ulrich Zwingli volume. Okay, And the translation into English of the transcription of the debate runs to at least 80 pages. Right, And so what I did was I took the first half of the debate, because when the counselors say we're tired and we want to go for supper, that was true. That's what they did. They stopped, and then they came back. And there's another half of the debate that keeps on going, and we didn't even get to that. Okay, That one focused much more on Zwingli's 67 theses and a debate as to whether the theses themselves were right or wrong and so on and so forth. I figured our modern audience does not have the stamina to go <laughs> on to part two. So we stopped with part one. And even in part one, what I did was I read through it and then I basically condensed. Because each speaker spoke for like seven pages at a time. And I couldn't make expect that anyone would really listen patiently to such a long-winded explanation. So I did not alter the substance of what was said, but I condensed it. So people were speaking in paragraphs rather than in pages. I figured for a modern ear that would work better. I know a number of people here are interested in getting a copy of, the of my, of my write-up, basically, of this play. I'm happy to circulate it. So uh, I know a number of people have asked me already, but if you're interested, maybe send me an email. And then by return, I will send you a copy in case you want to use it as a teaching tool or anything else. And I think, I think for, for what we were doing, it worked out very well. And you could see how it could be useful in a classroom setting. It's not an overwhelming thing for a student, for instance, to read and make sense of. I think it's fair to say also the debate itself was, n the, the result was not a surprise, <laughs> even at the time, right? I mean, Swingley had the wind behind him in a certain sense in terms of city support. He wasn't going to launch himself in the debate without knowing that the end result was pretty secure, that that was, that was going to go his way. Uh, but we have gathered our, our people together today to have this panel discussion, and it's a time to ask questions you haven't had a chance to ask yet, or maybe to reflect a little bit on commonalities that have come up over the course of these presentations, um, other, other issues that have come to mind. Um, so I maybe, I maybe want to start out and talk with people about really the Swiss Reformation's what, what we should take from the Swiss Reformation. In other words, if the Swiss Reformation is significant, why is it significant for a modern audience? What is it that we should be thinking about in terms of its ongoing significance? And I think each of you might have a different answer, but that's fine. There's a microphone you can pass up and down in response to that question. The, the ongoing significance, why, why does it matter? Well, I'll start. Um, on the, uh, the first thing I would say is it's important to recognize the Reformation was a much broader phenomenon than Luther and Calvin. We've already alluded to that. Um, but I did say at the end, that, you know, there are many of these same dynamics with respect to church and state that we're dealing with today. Um, I can remember Emilio Campi coming here and giving a paper on Islam and its perception in the uh, in the Reformation and the the, the proximate cause of that was a very practical problem in Switzerland of how to license imams today because mm -hmm. there were regulations about what kind of coursework they had to do and where they could do it. Um, and it's a problem that a challenge faced in Switzerland and places like Germany and other places. So the establishments of these, uh, these kinds of various establishments of church and states are still with us today in terms of their legacies. So um, it's important to know where they came from as Bruce was talking about earlier, um, 
why they had the kinds of views that they did about these sorts of things. So. Mm -hmm. I think one of the uh, remarkable things, Amy was talking about the, the diversity of views within this, but I, what I find extraordinary is that in many ways this creates a whole new world. Uh, whether you think of consistories, whether you can think just of the way the sacramental debates are going, what these churches even looked like, what the liturgy looked like in the Grossmünster at Easter 1525. Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there, there's no kind of blueprint for mm -hmm. any of this. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, in that sense, they kind of create it. I, you know, the, of course, they would deny innovation, um, but they, they are, it's, it's extraordinarily creative mm -hmm. in, of, a, of, a, of a Christian world that in many ways has no, um, nothing like it, although they're constantly looking to history and look to the early church, but you know, the, in a way they look to the past and see themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and it's so that... There's this, and you know, Calvin and others will in, inherit what these people are doing in the 1520s. But the extraordinary imagination that they have in creating this new vision of a Christian society, which of course has strong roots in the medieval world and all, and all the rest of it, but nothing quite like this has existed before. Yeah, absolutely. Others? The thing that I w noticed also is that the Reformation is a time of intense religious change and also intense social change, and that's kind of the intersection that I was looking at. And some of these questions, so there's two sides of it. One is, when I talk to a Swiss person today, one of the things they ask me is, why do you study the poor? Mm -hmm. Like, we don't think about that in Switzerland. <laughs> and I first looked at him like, okay, but isn't that in part because People have already thought about it in many ways. It's, it's sort of like they're at the other side of it. The people have already gone through the hard work in some ways of kind of trying to figure out what do you do with the poor and needy within your community? What do you do with the poor and needy that come into your community as outsiders? You know, how do you treat them? And I think that there's, those questions are ongoing. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the Reformation does is it provides some ways that it was dealt with. And on the other hand, it already dealt with some things. Mm -hmm. And so that certain people don't deal with them anymore. They have procedures, structures, institutions, social welfare structures already in place now mm -hmm. that do that work for them so they don't even have to think about it. Yeah. So I think there's all of these kind of layers that the Reformation does. And I'll end with this point. One of my students, when I was talking about poverty and wealth, and I talked about the Reformation, said, you know, I don't have any religious background at all, but I did not realize that all my views came from religion. <laughs> and I think that's sort of this awakening that some students even today are sensing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in some ways, religion is always about the question of how does the the world of transcendence connect with the world of time and space and that just fundamental question of how these two come together and late medieval Catholicism in many ways was comfortable with that question in its externalities it had a, it was a very material tangible way of expressing the faith and the reformation you know we talk about the spiritualists but all re the reformers were all, in some ways, they were spiritualizers. It was the, a great internalizing of, of faith. And it starts out as a kind of rejection of that material expression of faith. But then the question immediately returns. So you have this internal experience of, of salvation. How is that then reconnected with the world and that basic question um, does not have easy answers. And I think we see in the Swiss Reformation a struggle to find expression to that how, do, how does word and flesh come back together. And it's seen in an abstract form in some ways in the sacramental debates. It's seen in a very tangible form in the efforts of the Anabaptist communities to say, well, it comes back together 
in the incarnation, in the embodied expression of Christian faith of the body of believers who are trying to live this out collectively. Zwingli also has a collective understanding of this, but I think it's a rich laboratory mm -hmm. for trying to untangle how is the spirit embodied? I wanted to let John go first because in part what I would say is this whole question of authority and dissent. How it, the Reformation starts out as this movement we all dislike the status quo. The status quo has got to change. We reject the claims of the authority of the Roman church. But what are we going to put in its place? And what, what happens when we disagree? Mm -hmm. And how much can we disagree? How much disagreement can we allow and still maintain social order? And these are questions that I still, I mean, they're, they're burning questions today. Mm -hmm. And if we can, one of the advantages about talking about the Reformation is that it's 500 years ago. It's safely distant yep. so that students yep. can discuss these questions without feeling that their political views are being threatened. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can get them to see how it arises in one particular context, and this is where the Swiss Reformation is a really good foil to the Wittenberg Reformation. Yes. It wasn't just one person coming up, but Luther disagrees with the Catholics, but then the Swiss disagree with Luther, mm -hmm. and then Zwingli's followers disagree, and, 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 it, and again, it's the problem that faces Protestantism today. Yeah. How do you interpret the Bible, and who's got the authority to do it? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Other questions people want to ask, other themes you want to pick up on, ideas that are sort of you've been wrestling with as you've been listening to these presentations. Shirley. Uh, this is a question for any of you. As I listened to all of you, I, you know, I kept thinking, this is five, I, I valued this, it was really a rich experience for me since 500 years ago. And I kept thinking about the little I know about the era in which we live now and the comparison of the intense hopper of kind of a late Christendom in Europe um, where people are having their differences and sorting things out and creating a whole new world and then wondering about what the implications are for the type of world we create now in a digital age where communications go across the world, where religious traditions are beyond the realm of Protestant Catholic divides, but it's Islam, it's Hinduism, it's everything. Um, and that, that doesn't mean, you know, it's always easy and simple. It's not. But how do we create, how do we, how do we take what is, can be learned from 500 years ago, bring it forward now to make it useful in creating again a new and different world with the scope of global, global religious pluralism and social pluralism and migration and everything else we're working with. Yeah, I, see the, I see the microphone sliding towards John. <laughs> Do you want to give it a try, John? It's really your area of expertise. Oh, boy. I'm... <laughs> well, at the risk maybe of just repeating some things that I said yesterday, I think... <laughs> Commemorations of the Reformation are an opportunity to reflect um, uh, appreciatively on this, this, these traditions which have shaped us. I think they're also, though, occasions for humility. Um, and I say that in part when I, you know, we're meeting at a seminary uh, that uh, seeks to pass along uh, a, a coherent tradition and has behind it an assumption or a set of understandings about what theology is. And in our seminaries, and I've, this is a huge generalization, but so often we say, well, we, we know what the theological questions are. They're mapped out in the books that are on the table. And then we look up at the world, and then we talk about contextual theology, so we teach theology here, and then we ask, well, how would it look like to translate the issues of the 16th century that in the traditions that we've inherited into 
a cultural context in Asia or Latin America or uh, an African context, then it becomes contextual theology. We're far less aware of the fact that our theology is contextual. Mm -hmm. And Amy gave a great example of that when she talked about the deep Platonic and Aristotelian roots that have shaped the nature of that sacramental debate in a very particular way in its understandings of reality and how transcendence enters into the world of time and space. And there are cultural settings of earnest Christians in other parts of the world for whom Plato and Aristotle in the sacramentarian context mm -hmm. doesn't communicate adequately how they have encountered transcendence. And it seems to me that even as we celebrate these traditions, we should be keenly aware of how deeply contextual our own expressions of, of theology are and not and, and as an enrichment to that, mm -hmm. not to denigrate it, mm -hmm. but to say, you know, there's, there's something that we have here, but we are participating alongside other Christians in something bigger than the, the Reformation. Mm -hmm. Other people's insights on this? I found I teach a lot of students who come from around the world and are part of these churches that are growing enormously. And one of the things that's, that's very enjoyable as an exchange in talking about the Reformation is absolutely, as we've just heard, the, the contextual aspects of it. And, and, and it, it's a moment for us to reflect on the contextual elements. But it's also very, they find it very interesting uh, looking at the Reformation for as just as many of the, the students um, who are going into uh, mostly in my case uh, mainline churches mm -hmm. uh, who are surprised to know that the Donatist, Donatist controversy relates so strongly to mm -hmm. questions that they're talking about now. But people who are coming from uh, other cultures still find, as, as Amy was saying, some of these fundamental questions of authority, scripture. I was just reading an, an essay for a volume that I'm working on, The Church in Ghana, and, and they're in many ways very strikingly different contexts, but in many ways strikingly similar questions. Mm -hmm. That, um, and I think one of the sort of ecumenical aspects of the reform of commemorating the Reformation is in broadening the conversation to a global conversation, but we still have a shared conversation of problems and questions that can that can span the historical uh, the 500 peri year period to make it, I think, very fruitful ways of of reflecting on where the church is going now. Absolutely. Uh, I endorse all of that that was said. I'm going to go a slightly different direction, though. Um, you know, 500 years is a long time, especially to an American. You know, um, it's it it's still a long time, no matter where, where you are from, I guess. But um, in places that uh, have longer memories and are more oriented towards rooting their identity and past, um, it's a little bit closer, a little more salient. So I, that's one what, that's one angle of it is. Even where practice has waned, part of people's self-understanding is still very much wrapped up with these identities and confessional identities and other sorts of things that, that uh, arrived at this inflection point in civilization. Um, you know, Related to that, there's, at least in the American context, but more broadly throughout Europe and the United States and the Anglo- um, Anglo-American context, there's a there's a kind of a crisis of the liberal order, you could say, right, and a questioning about where we're at, uh, so all sorts of existential kinds of questions. And there are certain narratives that have gained some salience about this, many of which are related because the identity still matter to people about his, their historical narratives about where we came from and so therefore where we're going. Um, so there's a, a, an article in yesterday's Chronicle Review, I think it's called Academia's Holy Warriors or something like this, and it's about particularly Patrick Deneen at Notre Dame, his, his book, Why Liberalism Failed, which is very much a narrative that's related to the questions of the Reformation and its legacy. And it's very much still a live issue, certainly for, for Roman Catholics. Um, uh, looking at, you know, say he makes, he, in, the, in the article he says something about Hungary. Hungary is a Protestant nation, right? So um, 
many of these tools for analysis are still very salient, and they're live questions about how we order our lives together and how we can find um, ways to live together without, you know, I would say reverting into some of the, the, the things that were experienced in the 16th century. So, Esther? Yeah, just one side note. Um, based on a comment that John made yesterday at the very end, it, it might have, I think actually it wasn't even part of your talk, now that I think about it. Um, it reminded me that I actually taught the history of world Christianity for a church in one day. <laughs> and at the end of that day, the response I got from lay parishioners, mostly, uh, was, so it sounds like the history of Christianity is basically about a lot of different conflicts. All right, so this goes to your question. And I thought about it and I said, yes, but that's the point. The point is that in the conflicts, most of them are terrible, but there's something generative that comes out of these conflicts that nobody would have really guessed. And not all of those things are all bad. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I think about when you ask what are the lessons we can learn and then projecting to the future is how to have conflict well. I think that one of the things we have learned is how to have conflict badly. We have so many examples of that. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a sense in which we don't want to do that anymore. Or, or, or we think, shouldn't we learn something from this and try a little bit better? So I think if I were to like try to pass on a lesson, it would be, yes, there is something generative about conflict, but we shouldn't pers just have it just for the sake of it. But are there ways we can have conflict better? or well, or more fruitful. And so I think that would be a lesson to take and pass on. Thank you. Other questions, things people want to ask or still contribute? Yes. It's conference about the Reformation in the context of church and state. But I would also like to emphasize the significance of the Reformation's contribution to freedoms, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, to the point that it became fundamental freedoms, inalienable freedoms, and have difficulty, but not with tolerance, freedom of tolerance, except those who are intolerant. And in today's society, it's the very opposite. The intolerant now I want to take away the fundamental freedoms of those who are very tolerant, say Christians and Christian community. So I think the real threat today is, again, to make sure that we remain true to and explain the ideal of fundamental freedoms to have conflict but a discourse rather than violence, if you will. So I see that the intolerant are taking over our freedoms of religion and conscience. Is that a fair observation? Any, uh, I think it's a debate that's certainly been ongoing and where you can certainly trace a lot of these back to the Reformation era, but also to other times. I mean, it's not a, a, only in the Reformation that you would see these emphases placed on being able to express one's beliefs in a way that allows still for other views to find their place. I mean, it's not, it's not unique to the Reformation. In other words, I'm not sure I would draw to Reformation necessarily the, 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 the focal point of the whole debate over toleration. I think there are other places that we would also look in the history of thought, in the history of cultures. It's not just at the Reformation, though I would take your point that the Reformation is one of the key moments, certainly, where people have to try and figure out how do we live together? How do we figure this out? And that actually ties to something I wanted to ask about, which is in perhaps a little bit older historiography now, there's been for quite a while an interest in the Swiss model as the model of the urban community, right? The urban world as opposed to Luther and the princely state. Does that really still help in understanding the Swiss Reformation, do you think? Or is that a model that has sort of had its day, and now we're, we're not really thinking so much of the Swiss Reformation in that particular 
optics. I think I would pick this up and tie it into Erasmus because mm -hmm. when Erasmus, the, the literate people were in the cities. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's been estimated that at least in some cities half the population could read, which is a pretty amazing amount when you consider literacy in the countryside was maybe 5%. Mm -hmm. And they were the ones that had access to these ideas. They are the ones that Erasmus is kind of practical piety. How do I live as a Christian in the world? That struck them. Those were questions. One of the things, and, and I will tie this into to something else that's kind of interesting. When you look at pastoral care in late medieval Germany, parishes were huge. Um, 3,000, 4,000. The, the city of Ulm had one parish. Mm -hmm. And if the priest is responsible for all of the, all of the pastoral care in, in Roman church law, who's going to take care of these people? Well, mm -hmm. you have mendicants. Um, but you also have vernacular religious treatises and, and this, this hunger for how do I live as a Christian? And I think that's the chord that Erasmus, those were the group that, that, to whom Erasmus, that's where Erasmus himself comes from. That's what he's appealing to. That's a very different spiritual climate than what you have in Wittenberg and in the, the large, uh, relatively sparsely populated, rural, illiterate Parishes, and I think that's mm -hmm. really what's more important. And I don't think we can dis distinguish between Swiss and South German. It, it mm -hmm. is this larger urban culture. It makes sense, Bruce. I think there's there's a problem with that very neat um, thing that somehow Zwingli came up with a theology that fit a kind of urban mm -hmm. context. Zwingli regarded his Heimat as Togenberg. And he regarded his patria as the Swiss Confederation. Mm -hmm. He never lionized the city of Zurich. He was an outsider in the city. He spoke in a way that would have identified him as essentially foreign. Um, I, and you know, Bern, Basel, Zurich, these are places which had enormous territorial yeah. and were deeply concerned. I mean, the Reformation was, not, was by no means understood by them to be purely a civic mm -hmm. uh, event. And I don't, I mean, I think there's, there's important questions about how they worked out the relationship, as we've talked uh, for the last couple of days, about how they worked out the relationship to uh, temporal authority and certainly the degrees of accommodation, or as their opponents would say, uh, the ways in which they betrayed the Reformation principles in ad adapting to political power. But I don't, I think that political power in this period was, you know, surely the cities were dominant, but I don't think they were thinking purely in a civic. Yeah. I think I think that that model was very helpful, but I, I think further discussions would uh, would want to break it down. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything else? Other people wanted to ask. I did want to have one perhaps question that might lead us to a, our end point, and that was. As we've been listening, I think many of you have been shedding light on aspects of the Swiss Reformation that might need more research. In other words, gaps in the research. So, Ecolampadius sounds like a big gap, okay? So, students who are listening, you know, Ecolampadius, your guy, you know. Um, this could be good. Are there other gaps that you would want to identify? Areas where, you know what, we need more research in this area to really understand the Swiss Reformation better. Pass the mic. I think Jeff. There you go. Pass it down. Oh. Yep. Yep. Have, uh, as I've done my research, I have been struck again and again by how this narrative goes back to a very confessionalized interpretation, started by Bulinger, um, and continued through his his heirs in Zurich. And Zurich model has been just sort of imposed on everywhere else, and I think the seat of Zurich. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so easy to just follow what other people have done without going back to the sources. Mm -hmm. As a historian, we need to go to the archives, we need to go to the primary sources and just start reading them with an open mind. Mm -hmm. Others? 
um, a plug for the Post Reformation Digital Library, prdl.org. I mean, that's it's it's not certainly the only way, or, or uh, it's a, it's a it's a convenient way to get access to many of these primary sources, many of which uh, are figures even more perhaps obscure to the modern ear than ones we've mentioned already at this conference. But there's no shortage of work to be done. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think the silence up here is a little bit like where where not. I mean, we're mm -hmm. not to start. It's mm -hmm. not that there's no la there's a lack of places to work. Um, I could just say some encouragement to Esther, especially. What a great line of research on care for the poor. Um, my own research areas include interest in political economy. So, I think there's work to be done on questions of the economic ethics of the era, uh, questions of interest in usury, uh, and those sorts of things as particular areas of interest. But I mean, it's it's really wide open, and mm -hmm. especially given our we don't. We don't have. Um, we haven't. We don't have an excuse anymore mm -hmm. for not engaging this wider variety of primary sources that really needs to be delved into. I think one of the problems is, and this is one of the reasons that Ecolumpadius has vanished, and as did Heinrich Bullinger, um, we're prisoners to what's been translated. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one of the things is is that we need to make available sources. There is virtually nothing of. Bullinger to be read, apart from a very old translation of the decades, which is somewhat, more than somewhat in places, inadequate. Mm -hmm. um, Ecolampadius, is there anything? Well, uh, no, there are, there's a sermon digit translation of his sermons, and they have to self-publish it. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there are people in the Reformation, we, you know, we can't diversify our interpretation. I mean, scholars can do, it can do a certain degree of bringing their ideas and thoughts to the, to the public, but without any way for, for people uh, beyond the small circle of scholars to mm -hmm. have access to this material, uh, we will continue to redo the same narratives. Yep. And I think that's why it's helpful to have the Anabaptist texts. There's been a recent volume done, it was published in Kitchener, of later Anabaptist writings from the Bern area, sort of up in the um, later 16th through the 17th century. And I, I actually reviewed it, and it was a great book and hugely helpful. So, and that's a volume of Anabaptist writings translated into English, right? So everybody can read them. And that sheds so much light all of a sudden. It's, it's a wonderful thing. John? Well, I would say in my own area that would be um, a significant area of, of more re where more research is needed. It's understandable that people focus on the, on the origin moment and mm -hmm. the creation myths that go along with the origin moment of the first generation. Um, but in many ways, it's the question of the second and third generation, uh, sort of the, the limits of the Anabaptist reform. How did the Anabaptists... Uh, institutionalize mm -hmm. their um, their practices. How did they settle into routine uh, forms? I, th I find that that very interesting. Um, I would also say I think there's still more work to be done. I'm really unsettled by the ongoing notions that the Reformation is the wellspring of religious liberty. Mm -hmm. I, it just rings so false to me. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, it, it's a process that emerged in 1555 and at 1648, kicking and screaming and with only great legal... Uh, I mean, I, I, I just think there is much more work to be done in, in revisiting that set of assumptions. Absolutely. Jordan's, your, your talk ended with a picture of the St. Bartholomew, Bartholomew's Day Massacre. Yeah. You know, which is after Calvin's dead. It's there's there's no liberty there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So the fact that there's more work to be done is actually an encouraging thing, right? Um, these conferences are not the answer to everything. They're they're a door that opens up, that widens opportunities. That says, hey, there's a lot out here that we can learn about, that we can talk about, that we can develop if we take our own part in this conversation. At this point in time, I'd like you to join me in thanking our speakers. This has been a wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much. On your way out, there'll be a box where you can deposit in your name tags. We can recycle. This. One more thought just before you go, and that is to thank the person who brought us all together. Yes.
You're very welcome, indeed. Now, if you want to uh, recycle your name cards, that's very helpful. There's a box on your way out. Um, if you have any questions or anything, just ask us, and we hope to organize another one next fall. We're not yet sure of a topic, but there'll be something. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure of that. Thanks again.